So now that we've gone through um, all of the TCFD recommendations and the uh, four areas uh, that the recommendations are broken down to, we're going to go through a few examples uh, as an exercise together. As we go through each of these examples, take a moment to look through the excerpts that we put on the screen, knowing that it's only an excerpt, so it's possible that elsewhere in the documents you would find the information you're looking for. But consider what elements of that particular extract are particularly good, what further information could be included, and which elements could you adopt in your own reporting. We'll leave them on the screen for a moment and feel free to hit pause if you need additional time to think about each excerpt. And then I'll go through with you a few um, key points that you might have picked up um, as good practice and you might want to adopt in your own reporting. And then a few things that you might have noticed were missing and how you might be able to integrate those. So for our first example, we're looking at an excerpt that comes from Santander's Climate Finance Report in 2020. And this here shows a bit of what we're looking for in our governance disclosure. So on the right hand box in your screen, you can see what TCFD recommends for governance disclosures. Now take a moment, look at what Santander has put in this particular excerpt um, here in the diagram and have a bit of a think through what you think might be a good practice, a way maybe how they illustrated something or the words they're using and think about what maybe what's missing or what you'd like to see additionally in this. I'll just pause a moment so you can think. Okay, so just to go through a few of the best practices you might have seen in Santander's excerpt here. The first one is that they note in their uh, diagram here, what is the management oversight? So you can see here that they put um, under the board of directors, who is responsible for climate, and then as well as the management committee at the executive level, and so on and so forth below. And then you can see that they also included here the climate steering group, which gives you kind of the processes that are used for um, evaluating climate risks and opportunities. And of course, the frequency, which they note is how often they're meeting, whether they're meeting quarterly or annually or ad hoc. So this is alongside both A and B recommendations of governance, providing the frequency, the process, and how management oversight is undertaken. Another best practice you can see here is that they also provide information on the board oversight. So at the board level, they give you information on who is responsible and through what committees they're responsible for evaluating climate related risks and opportunities. I'm sure that you all found a few more than that, but just to give you a bit of a pointer of some best practice there. Some things that you might have noticed were missing are the exact role of the board of directors and the exact role of the management. Just to give you an idea how this could have been integrated, that here's an example from Novak Sustainability Report in 2020. Here, they provide a list for you of the exact roles, such as for the board of directors, they say that they approve the climate change initiatives. And then they also provide arrows to show you kind of the relationships between each of the teams. So this is another way that you can present in uh, illustrative ways how your governance is working. So for our next example, take a look at this excerpt from Adani Ports. And again, think what elements of this extract are particularly good? What could use further information? And which elements would you think about adopting in your own practices? I've included here on the right hand side, the recommended disclosures for both risk management and strategy, because both could be useful when reviewing this particular disclosure. Great, so let's look at a few things that you might have found here. First might have been that they put right at the top here, the responsible out of the executive management team. So this looks at the risk management process. Another area that they've pointed out here is how risks or opportunities impact your organization. So they've listed here the nature of their risk, as well as the strategic objective that's impacted by that risk. You might have also noticed that they give a column on the left hand side on the risk itself and then the nature of that risk. And as you notice, climate change is just one of many. 
So here they've integrated climate into their overall risk management portfolio. So something that you might have found was missing is the time horizons of that risk. Now this was a recommendation from the TCFD. And if you can see in our next slide here, Meridian Energy, which we've discussed before, provides a nice example of how they give their time horizons. So here they say, for example, extreme rainfall provides a time horizon of long term, so over the next 30 years. Um, but they also work with medium term risks on the right hand side, you can see five to 10 years. Now, this is up to your organization to determine what is short, medium and long term. But it's important for investors to know how you've determined that and what time horizons you're working with, because it can be different with every organization. For a final example, let's look at this excerpt from British Land's annual report of 2020. As with the previous, take a moment to look at what would you consider best practice, which of these would be recommended by TCFD, and maybe where they could use additional support. And then with that, Think about how you could use this in your own reporting. Okay, let's take a look at how you think they did. You might have noticed that British Land Annual Report has within it uh, metrics that are directly connected to risks and opportunities. So as you can see here, they've separated them out between climate-related risks and climate-related opportunities, which can be very helpful. And then another thing you might have noticed is that they provide the prior year's data, actually two prior year's data, and this helps develop a trend analysis, which in the same way of all our financial filings, trends can be very important to see how things are going over time. Now, that lends to something that might be missing as well, so let's keep going. So you might have noticed that even though they give a trend line, the targets aren't there for every metric. Now, it can be really important for investors to know where you're aiming for, not just where you're coming from. So they did provide some targets, for example, in their resource efficiency, but it can be helpful to provide targets for all of your metrics so that investors know where you're heading towards. And then, of course, including scope one, two, and three emissions would have been great as well, which likely is somewhere else in their report, but not in this excerpt. Now, just an example on how to provide some targets. We have an example here from Unilever, which gives alongside their trend lines, their target of where they're heading towards. So um, not just the past, but also future looking information.